I will. Okay, recording in progress. Uh... Okay. Um, so I'll just do a brief introduction on Manu's career path. So he he did his PhD at the University of Barcelona, and he uh, in his PhD he investigated the origin of vertebrates at the genomic level. And then he did two postdocs, one at Stanford at the Fraser Lab and another one in Toronto with Ben Blenkovs. Um, and in 2014, he joined the CRG as a group leader. And the same year, he got an ERC starting grant. Uh, in 2018, he's been you know, nominated as an Envoy Young Investigator. And uh, he was appointed as an ICREA Research Professor. And in 2020, which, you know, uh, it's good to have some good news in 2020, he got the ERC Consolidator Grant, so yeah. Um, and he basically his lab is interested in understanding the role of alternative splicing in vertebrate development and evolution. And his research has a strong focus on microexons, which I find quite fascinating. These are like, I mean, he'll talk about it, but these are very uh, short exons. It could be as short as two amino acids. And it's been shown that they are extremely important for a neuronal development. Uh, in vertebrate evolution, but also in in, the, in human diseases such as autism. So I'm, you know, I'm really excited to hear about what you're going to tell us today about these uh, microexons. And his talk is entitled "Parallel Evolution of Neuronal Microexons in Insects and Vertebrates." So, Manu, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marta, um, and thank you for the invitation. I think, I think it's very good to to be able to to talk uh, before of you, all of you. Of course, it's a bit of a pity that even even being in the same city, we have to do it through Zoom. And you know, I hope, because I don't even know the BSC to be honest, so it's a bit uh, of a shame. So definitely, I have to to pass by and visit once all this is done. And yeah, so I will share my screen. Um, you see it uh, now, right? Yes. Okay. So yeah, I decided to to talk about microexons in general. You know, maybe some of you already heard some bits of it, and and I will also uh, go through some of the basics, some of the introduction, which is not super new. I mean, since it's from 2014, but I thought it would be good to give you a. I know you're muted. I don't know what happened. Hi, did I? I I can hear him. You do. I can hear it too. Okay. Yeah. And uh, now you're back again. Okay. Uh, so I hope my internet is actually not too bad. Uh, we've been having troubles at home. So does it does it break or anything? Is it it's just fine? It's good to me. Okay. So mm -hmm. anyway, otherwise let me know. And not that I think I'll be able to do much, but at least so I know. Okay. No. So what I was saying is that I will I will I will talk about microexons in general. So I'll introduce them. Uh, a little bit from the beginning, but of course I will focus more on the recent work. But with the hope of, of you know, like making you hopefully at the end of the talk believe that they are very uh, exciting and fascinating uh, type of exons and type of uh, genomic elements. Um, I guess you know I'm a biologist, but I've, I've basically been doing bioinformatics for for many years. Uh, still, the the talk has some kind of wet lab kind of work. I hope. Although you're, you I guess, mostly all computational. It's not, uh, you know, it's not too much uh, wet lab. Uh, I try to make it simple. To make it simple. Okay. So just uh, without uh, more introduction, then I'll, I'll I'll go through it. So uh, just just very quickly, uh, this is the classic uh, uh, first slide that I uh, normally use. As to say, the, the, the big uh, kind of questions that I'm interested in, and I guess like in, uh, many of you there. I'm sure it's trying to understand how a single genome sequence uh, that is shared by all the cells is able to give rise to this huge complexity of cell types and, and, and then structures and, and organs that we have in, in, in the adult organisms, especially in organisms as complex as human. And of course, we now know that the, the trick for this to happen is that the genome is regulated uh, in time uh, and space in a very uh, thorough manner to give rise to specific transcriptomes and proteins in each of the cells. And these are, of course, the essence of, and of, of these cell types. But to me, what is interesting here is that, although this makes a lot of sense, uh, when we think about it, 
there's a, there's a, a bit of a caveat, and is that the number of genes in the genome is of course uh, fixed, and many of these cells actually share many of the genes. So just to give you uh, some numbers on this, this is the distribution of our genes based on the number of cell and tissue types in which they are e expressed. And you can see that only a minority, well, 10%, are very cell or tissue type specific, whereas more than half of the genes are expressed in, in a wide variety of cell and tissue types. So what is interesting here is to think that it might be that a given gene uh, might be having a different optimal functionality, or so a given protein, a different optimal functionality in the neuron than it may have, for example, in the muscle. So in terms of uh, evolution, it's, it's a little bit tricky for, for natural selection to optimize the function of that protein for whatever it's doing in, in, in the neuron without really affecting negatively what it's doing in the, in the other cell types. So this bit of, um, of the balance. And this is something that I, I find quite interesting is, is this sort of a contradiction of, of paradox of how can you optimize protein functions for the different cell types. And of course, there are many tricks to this uh, gene, gene duplication, et cetera, that I'm also interested in. But the one that I want to focus on here is on alternative splicing. And this is a, a post transcriptional, perhaps better say, pre translational process uh, that is common to all the eukaryotes. And I'm probably you, you, you know about it. And uh, basically, the idea is that our genes are broken into pieces, which are the exons, which are these boxes here. And, and they're interrupted by these non-coding sequences that need to be removed by the machinery of the cell, which is uh, the process called splicing, to generate these mRNAs that will then give rise to the protein. And the idea is that it's possible that the cells uh, regulate this uh, process in certain ways so that some of the transcripts uh, for instance, include all the three exons here, but others may skip one exon, for example, giving rise to a slightly different mRNA, which uh, may or may not translate into a slightly different protein. So you can also have cases in which this regulates uh, gene expression, etc. But uh, in other cases, we know at least that uh, produce a different protein isoform. Now, this is interesting because if you consider one of these broadly expressed genes, it is possible, at least in theory, that the cell regulates these exons in a very specific, tissue-specific manner. So now this exon is only expressed in, in the neurons, whereas the rest of the, pro, uh, the cell types express this other protein isoform. And now the uh, evolution can work on this sequence alone to optimize the function of this protein for the neuron without really affecting the function that the protein has in the other cell types. So to me, this is a, a very interesting uh, approach to alternative splicing. In other cases, we can think of novel functions, et cetera, but this would be more of a subtle regulation of or, or a specialization of the function. So uh, some time ago, I wanted to uh, research into this, in particular, uh, into the exons that are specific of, of the neurons. So we search for them. And this is something that well, I guess you're probably very familiar with, but we can do this, of course, with RNA-seq uh, without much uh, problem. Uh, we can quantify the inclusion of the exon, of all the exons in our genome in, in every single cell and tissue type. And this is an example of what we're looking for. So this, every dot here means uh, the inclusion, so that the gene, first of all, that the gene is expressed in a given tissue, and this is the percentage of inclusion of that exon in the transcripts of that gene in that given tissue. So you can see that in this particular exon, the gene is broadly expressed, but uh, it's mainly, the exon is mainly skipped. So it's not present in the transcripts in most of the cell types. But in neural samples, you can see there's a very high inclusion. So pretty much all the transcripts from this gene will have uh, the inclusion of this exon. So uh, assuming that this is either translated, this will have mainly no exon and here only exon. So, this is uh, the kind of thing that we were looking for, and we found like uh, around a thousand of, of these exons. Uh, so of course, there's not so many, but there's still like a, a decent amount of, of such exons. And when we see the kind of functions that they impact, you see that all things that you may think are relevant for, for neuronal biology and neurogenesis uh, related to synapse, vesicle transport, also the cytoskeleton for the shape of the neurons, etc. So there's a lot of possibilities uh, to understand uh, for these exons. But really what, what triggered, uh, what caught our attention when, when we found this was to see that these exons, the neural exons, were actually much shorter than the rest of the exons in the genome. And 
what was even more striking was that the converse was true, right? So when we uh, being the the exons in our genome by by length, you can see here exons that are very tiny, as Martha was saying, like uh, three, six, or nine. They wouldn't call one, two, or three amino acids up to regular exons. So the average is 150 in the genome. You can see that the very the smallest exons have a very strong tendency to be more included in the neurons than in any of the cell type. And in fact, what we see is that these exons are many times only included in the neurons. So this was uh, quite striking for us because it meant, first of all, that these exons could actually exist before it wasn't clear because it's not easy to detect them, etc. And even more exciting, it seemed that this seemed to be like an ability that mainly neurons had. So we were quite excited about this. This is what we define as microexons, so one to nine amino acids encoded, so three to 27 nucleotides. And then just to give you a sense, another example, a more visual perhaps of how neuron specific they are. These are four examples. You can see the, the sizes. They're basically uh, not expressed at all in the embryonic stem cells. This is a differentiation time course uh, from stem cells to glutamatergic neurons. And you can see that as differentiation proceeds, there's a complete switch. And now pretty much all the transcripts from these genes will have these microexons. So uh, this is not just these few examples, but actually the majority of these neural microexons have these massive switches of more than 70% uh, inclusion levels. So we're talking about a whole program that gets basically switched on during neural differentiation, affecting around 300 proteins or so. So this was uh, uh, quite exciting. And then uh, we just basically wanted to understand everything. And this is what I've been working on in, in the past years. And this is just some of the big questions. Uh, I will just give you uh, some small insights into the first three, and then I'll focus more on the evolution because I think it covers uh, different aspects also related to the others. So I didn't say it, but please, if you have any question, please interrupt me at any point, especially with these Zoom talks, I think it's quite, quite nice because otherwise you think you're talking to your uh, window. So, so please go ahead. Uh, but then, okay, so regarding the, the first, um, the first question, which is how, how they are regulated. Here, what we did, I mean, we tried different things, uh, but basically we use uh, the amount of RNA seq that was available uh, at the time for different RNA binding protein knockdowns and overexpression, et cetera. And it was very nice because we actually were very lucky and saw that a single splicing factor family was really behind the inclusion of these exons in neurons. And this one is uh, SSRM3 and 4, uh, it's here is SSRM4. And, and as you can see, it fits very nicely because it's expressed a little bit earlier in neural differentiation and it picks soon. And you can see the microexons kind of coming after that. And it's also very specific for neurons. So we don't see it in, in other brain types and, and nowhere in the body. And uh, so then the way this, this splicing factor works uh, also fits quite well with with the patterns and basically it's uh, we know the targets are basically ignored so they the spliceosome doesn't recognize these exons in stem cells or early progenitors and then in post-mitotic uh, developing neurons this factor is expressed and it binds right upstream of the target exons and this is what uh, nucleates or, or enhances the spliceosomal formation and recognition of, of the exon or the microexon so this is a rather simple model and what is nice is that it also makes it a very clean prediction and it is if we believe this protein is the key for microexon inclusion then if we take this this uh, gene we overexpress it in any type of cell that is not neuron and doesn't have microexons like hela cells or 293 cells then we expect the microexons to be included right and this is exactly what we did we, we just clone it we express it in, in different type of cells uh, typical from the lab and we saw in fact, very nicely that this expression is sufficient to have uh, very high inclusion levels of more than around 80% of the neural microexons. And, and here we're talking about basically they go from zero inclusion in these cells to 100%. So it's a, it's a very clear uh, switch. And another thing that was very nice is that actually this effect was very specific. So not only uh, it was, it was you know, necessary and sufficient, but actually the targets were very small exons. So it seems like this protein is basically there just to include these microexons in the neurons. So this would be the distribution of uh, exon lengths in, in the genome, the alternative exons. And this is uh, the main targets of this factor. 
Uh, and then just to show you a bit more, this is uh, a direct effect. Of course, it looked like a direct effect, but we have to show it. And this is uh, basically Clipsic. Uh, I guess you're familiar with it's like ChipSeq, but the, at the RNA level, you can see the very clear peak of the protein exactly where we expect it, right next to the to the microaxons. And then this uh, is more of an indirect evidence, but this is the accumulation of the UGC motif that we know it's related to, to the binding of this uh, factor. And you can see how it quickly accumulates. So most or pretty much all the microaxons have this UGC motif within 20 to 10 uh, nucleotides of strings the microaxons. And when we mutate this UGC, the microaxons don't get included. So with this, then uh, we can conclude that this family is actually a master direct uh, regulator for most microaxons uh, in, in mammals. So this is good uh, because it makes a clean scenario, which of course you can imagine is a bit more complex, but just for simplicity, I'll show it here. Uh, we have these microaxons, which are not recognized by the machinery because it's too small and, and it's not uh, easy uh, for the machinery to find, to, to actually splice these very small axons. Uh, they're ignoring most of the cell types and we have this uh, canonical ancestral protein isoform. And then in neurons, because this factor is expressed, we have these switches and now they will include these microaxons. In, most, in many cases, up to 100% inclusion. And this also is nice because it allows us to do uh, the first test on the second question, which is the biological relevance. Since we saw it so specific and, and so important, we can knock down this factor or knock out this factor and see what consequences it has. And this is uh, what uh, Mathieu Kesnevalier did in, in the lab of Ben Blanco when I was doing my postdoc there and we were collaborating on this. Um, I go very quickly because it wasn't mainly my work and, and also because of it's mouse biology, but just to uh, tell you that uh, basically the mice are not very happy. They die soon after birth because they cannot breathe. Only 15% of them survive, which have tremors and, and all the locomotor issues. And then he characterized many neuro neurodevelopmental defects. Uh, I don't know, some like this, this one I found particularly cool and, and clear, which is that there's a problem with axon guidance. Normally axons kind of cross the midline in the corpus callosum in, in the brain, but these ones just don't recognize this, this cue and they just continue in the same uh, side of the brain. And then as you can see here, there's many uh, issues forming the synapses and the connections between the neurons. So this is the, the nerve that innervates the diaphragm. So of course it kind of explains why they cannot breathe. And, and this is the, the gene knockout, the SSRM4 knockout. But interestingly, there was also some clear phenotypes in the heterozygous, which has milder uh, down regulation and the mouse in principle, it looks good. But when look uh, more in detail, actually it's, it's clear they has a lot of issues with neuronal function. So it has impairment in, in and uh, you know synaptic function etc and what it was most interesting is that it actually has several um, behavioral defects that really recapitulate the hallmarks of autism uh, spectrum disorder so basically as i show here the mouse normally tend to interact with other mouse when you put them in in, in this sort of uh, three chamber uh, tests but these mouse were not social so basically they just didn't care about the mouse and they interacted with some uh, inanimate object and, and this was interesting because we also saw the microaxons were misregulated in, in many individuals with autism spectrum disorder. And actually this heterozygous uh, mouse recapitulated quite well this milder misregulation. So what we think is happening in, in some of these um, uh, individuals is that indirectly, so it's probably not a mutation in, in the gene, it's, it's something that you know, is more of a general transcriptome uh, defect these microaxons may contribute to uh, the imbalance of the neuronal function leading to some of these or help contributing to some of these autistic defects. So anyway, this is uh, for the biological functions. But then something that uh, really intrigued me is how they do that. So how is it possible that something as small as one or two or three amino acids can have these these effects in in our in our biology, and this is just to give you an example. This is ANC13B, which is a, a, a gene that is involved in neurotogenesis. So remember this uh, defect in in innervation and axon growth that I show you uh, very briefly, and we showed that this protein, when having or not having the microaxon, has the, uh, has a, a quite a clear phenotype. So with the microaxon, you have normal axons, but without the microaxon, you have like smaller axons. And you can see it's a very long protein as usual in the, in the, in the neurons. 
And what is striking to me is that this here is the two amino acids encoded by the microexome. So these amino acids here in the middle of the protein are the ones that make the big difference. So this is uh, quite a quite an intriguing thing. How how is it uh, that that they can completely change the function of the protein? And therefore, we look a little bit more in detail. Uh, and what we saw is basically because they are small, they can have a specific properties compared to other uh, neural alternative exons and for sure other uh, alternative exons. And basically is that they can be inside domains. And this is something that normally alternative exons cannot, cannot do because they would disrupt the domain. So you can imagine a structure, you put something in between to just break it. But here, what did they do is that they add two amino acids, for example, to a specific loop inside the domain. And we see this uh, enrich uh, compared to longer neural exons and even more, even to any kind of exon for domains that are involved in, in protein binding. So protein-protein interactions. And another pattern that we saw is that when they were not inside domains, they were actually right next to the domain. So we see them in the kind of PFAN prediction, for instance, you see the domain and right next to it, when it finishes, you see the microx. So we think this also contributes to modulating the function of, of the domains. And importantly also, we see these microexons are always, nearly always in the surface. So you don't see them inside the protein or anything. It's, it's there where, where the protein interacts. And it also changes, I mean, adds the specific types of amino acid, especially charged amino acids. And even more, the, these proteins that have these microexons are normally involved in protein complexes. So all these basically told us that maybe they, what they're doing is to slightly modulate protein-protein interaction. So this is just to visualize um, the, the type of patterns that I show you. This is, you can see a very structured potassium channel that has a, a four amino acid microexon. You see that it's not disrupting the, the structure and it's just in the surface where all the interactions happen in these uh, channels. And then this is the other type of pattern, robot one, which is a key gene in this axon guidance uh, phenotype that I show you. And you can see how you have these two immunoglobulin domains here and the microexome fall right next in between. them. So probably this gives like higher flexibility or creates a hinge or something like that. So uh, then, uh, as I said, I would believe this could contribute to modulating protein-protein interactions. And just as a proof of principle, back then we, we had this example that I think is very uh, illustrative. So this is APP1, it has a two amino acid microexome, again, so very small one. This is the PTB, so this is a PTB1, it's a binding domain. You can see here the helices and here in this surface in blue is where the interactions occur. And the microexon is right here in this loop between the two alpha helices. So when you put uh, one of these non partners you can very clearly see or very suggestively that this microexon is gonna have some impact in how these interactions occur. And indeed, we, we show this by uh, two different methods, basically related to QIPs. And you can see that the microexome basically modulates this interaction. It doesn't disrupt it. It's not a big effect, it's like a twofold, but uh, the uh, contribution of, of all these interactions ends up requiring this protein-protein uh, interaction network in, in the synapse. Because as uh, we know now, around 40 or 50% of microexomes can at, at least modulate some interactions. So this is uh, a little bit the, the intro, or let's say presentation of the microexons. And uh, I don't know if you have any question uh, about this now. Otherwise I, I, I will continue uh, on the part of, of the evolution of, of microexons. And this is something that I found particularly fascinating. I mean, I love evolution obviously, but trying to understand how these elements that in principle were you know, we found them in, in mammals, but we have nothing, no idea about uh, when or if other animals or other species have it. So it was quite a, quite intriguing uh, and quite exciting. So this was mainly the work of Antonio. And the first question, when we study the, the origin of something, obviously you have two questions, which is the when something originated and how it originated. So where are the evolutionary mechanisms behind? So the first one, the one is actually normally easier. So for this, obviously, we just took RNA-seq from as many species as possible from different uh, tissues and cell types, whatever we can get our hands on, covering from uh, vertebrates, uh, closer relatives, and then the classic invertebrates, and even non non bilaterians and, and even non-animals. And the answer here 
to cut the long story short is that we saw that most of the pilotarians actually have microexons and they also tend to be neural specific. And this is, seems to be a bilateral specific thing. So uh, just to show you how this looks, this is the, when we take the neural, uh, so the tissue specific microexons, you see most of them are just neural upregulated. A few we know that are in muscle and the rest is kind of like uh, noise. And something very similar is what we see in Drosophila. So something quite specific of, of the nervous systems. So then we can be sure that at least by the last common ancestor of bilaterians, we had these neural microexons. But we could not really tell because the, the, these animals are jellyfish, they don't really have tissues that it make things easier. We could not really tell if they were be, be, before. So for this, we, we moved to C anemone, which is a quite well established model system by now of uh, this Nidarian. And we collaborated with the lab of Fabian Ranch because they had a, a transgenic animal that basically express uh, a fluorescent protein in all the neurons. So after some optimization, they managed to fax sort the, the, the neurons uh, from the rest of the, of the cells. And when we look at microexons there, we actually got a very nice negative result because we saw, first of all, that they didn't have many microexons, just very few and on the longer range. And there was absolutely no enrichment between neurons and non-neurons. So it was a very different pattern from what we see in, in the rest of the of the bilaterians, so in the in, in the bilaterians. So we can be confident with this and what I'll show you now that actually microexons originated sometime uh, before the origin of bilaterians or in the last common ancestor of bilaterians. And then uh, we move to the next question, which is the how this happened. And, and the obvious candidate, of course, is to look for the regulator since we have such a clear master regulator. Uh, so the first indication for it would be uh, to look for the, this UGC motif associated to microexons, since we know it's, it's like a, the footprint of, of this regulation. And the issue here was that we didn't, so we thought at the time that um, this regulator only was present in vertebrates, because when uh, it was published, it was described as vertebrate specific. So we were not sure of whether we would find anything or not. But to our surprise, we saw that all these microexons had a very similar enrichment in the same position uh, for all these uh, bilateral species. So clearly, it was an indication that this uh, factor was behind. But as I said, we thought it didn't exist in these other species. So then we uh, decided to look a little bit more in detail. And here I get into the details of this protein. Hopefully, it won't be too complex. But just to say that this is the classic uh, splicing factor that basically is like a protein with a huge SR domain, uh, which is a low complexity region, and pretty much nothing else except for this PFAM domain that was not characterized. And, and pretty much we didn't know anything about it. And then when we look at this in, in our genome, what we found is that there's three paradox in total, and we could make sure that, I mean, we, we could associate uh, this, this gene and uh, SSRN3, which is actually also able to regulate microexons, but I, I won't get into it uh, for simplicity. Uh, and these are uh, associated uh, uh, from an evolutionary point of view with SSRM2, which is a very ancestor, uh, like a very ancient splicing factor that is known to be involved in, in core splicing regulation and also alternative splicing. And it was present since the very origin of, of eukaryotes. So this is present in all the cells uh, out there. And this, this factor actually, it also has this repeat and uh, this uh, uh, domain. And it has also very conserved uh, structure regions here that are known to interact with the rest of the splices that were not present in this, uh, in this gene. So then this was intriguing because we have something that looks novel and something that is very ancient that uh, was uh, sub-functionalization or neo-functionalization from the two rounds of whole genome duplication of vertebrates. But when we look at, in the other animals, what we saw is a little bit what we expected and is a single gene that looks very much like this ancient uh, splicing factor. So you can see they all have this very conserved uh, structure here. Uh, but what uh, was surprising was to see that this PFAM domain was actually also present in all the bilaterians, but not in any non bilaterian So all the sea anemone, the plants, etc., they don't have this PFAM domain. So that was that was already quite interesting. And then the second thing that was actually quite um, unexpected is that we noticed that all the non-vertebrate bilaterians 
had actually a lot of alternative splicing in the gene. And uh, not only alternative splicing, but also different alternative terminations, different promoters, etc. And this happened only in these uh, animals like flies or amphiopsis, etc., but not invertebrates or in the non bilateral. So uh, after looking quite a lot about these different isoforms, we actually ended up focusing on this alternative termination, which is present in all these uh, species. And this is interesting because it encodes this uh, region of the PFAN domain. And you can see here, this is the one that uh, was present in, in SRM4 and 3, but not in SRM2. You can see it's extremely conserved uh, motif. It's small, but it's very conserved across all these animals. And what is nice is that it's encoded basically in two pieces. So you have one in the uh, last exon and then another in the second to last exon. And it's always interrupted by something that when it's included, it basically disrupts the domain because you have a stop cotton. So you have an incomplete domain and you need to include skip this section basically to have the full domain. Um, this is nice because when we look at the regulation of this event, we see that it's mainly, the, the whole domain is mainly put together only in neural samples. And in the rest of the, of the cells, basically they have this disruptive, uh, disrupted domain. So this was uh, quite a suggestive, of course. So we decided to go and clone uh, different uh, isoforms with and without the full domain. From different species and use this trick that I showed you before about uh, expressing them in human non-neural cells that don't have microexons and see if they could perhaps trigger the inclusion of endogenous human microbes. And very nicely, somewhat to our surprise because things don't normally work that well, we saw that in every single case, no matter which species it was, fly or sea urchin, etc., when we had the domain, the full domain, this was sufficient to enhance the inclusion of endogenous human microexons, but it never happened when we have a disrupt and not like a disrupted domain. So it seemed very clear that first of all, this domain was essential for microexon inclusion. And second, that this was a very, very conserved mechanism because you can have uh, fly proteins enhancing human microexons. So then uh, we was wanted to uh, test the last thing since we thought this was um, clearly an evidence that this domain was important for the origin of these uh, programs of neural microexons. And it's, we went back to this ancestral looking protein in the jellyfish. And we, as I said, it doesn't have the PFAN domain. So now, not surprisingly, when we express it in, in the cells, we don't see the inclusion of, of the human microexons. And then we wanted to make like an evolutionary chimera, what we think happened sometime in the, uh, some common ancestral bilaterians which is we fuse the last two exons of the human protein with the ancestral uh, nematostella protein. And this is the evolutionary chimera. And now we do see the inclusion of, of these neural microexons. So we think that just the origin of this domain in this uh, splicing factor as an alternative isoform was really the key uh, for the microexon inclusion. And so just to summarize this, then, like I said, this factor was a, a general splicing factor and present in all eukaryotes. And at some point, Somehow, we don't really know how, how this happens because it doesn't look like anything that we know. This uh, uh, general splicing factor acquired a new alternative isoform that was regulated only in the neurons. And we think this is what allowed the origin of the neural microexon proteins. And then in the case of vertebrates, what we have is a two rounds of whole genome duplication, then a subfunctionalization of these different uh, functionalities. So now this is a little bit the story of the region, but then another key conclusion I think is that the microexons are key ancestral building blocks in, of animal neurons because we really see them in all, in all these bilateral. So we are fairly confident about this uh, for, for tetrapods uh, and a little enough for saprophytes as well, but we didn't know about this in, in other invertebrates. So in the last uh, slides, I will uh, just very briefly talk about some results that we got in, in flies, trying to see what the function of, of these uh, genes, of these microexons is there. So for that, we did the obvious. We just used CRISPR to delete this uh, domain so that now we maintain the ancestral uh, function, this SSRN2 function, but we just abolish the, the microexon regulator function. And what we have is basically a reduced viability, which by chance kind of it looks like the mouse uh, one, but I think this is, is just chance. Uh, so most of them die and the ones that uh, survive are actually smaller flies, showing that they have some, some developmental delays, etc. And then uh, this is 
how the surviving flies look. I don't, I mean, I don't know much about flies, but I think it's pretty obvious from this video that these are not happy flies. And they are, you can see they have tremors, they cannot uh, turn around, so they, they're really, uh, I don't know, screwed up, let's say. And then uh, we, we did many phenotypings that I won't go into detail, but this one is also quite, I think, uh, illustrative. You see on the left, okay, this here. You can see the flies, the normal flies going up uh, quickly, but the, the other ones, uh, the wild types, they just don't, they don't manage to climb. And this is, these motor behaviors is, are interesting because as I said, in mouse, we also see uh, similar ones. But then I uh, wanted to get a, a few more um, details on how this happens. So we turned into the larvae uh, of Drosophila, which are tractable, uh, much more tractable. And you see, although it's small, these are the, the larvae just crawling in the wild type. Although they're small, uh, slow, but they go like in a straight line. You can see here, the knockout, they just go around in circles very slowly. So we can trace these uh, trajectories and, and analyze them. And basically what we can see here is, first of all, the larvae uh, go slowly, uh, go much slower, and they don't just don't go straight, they just go in circles. And normally they have like this curve uh, bodies. So clearly the, the locomotor, uh, they have locomotor defects as well. So then we try to understand what was the reason for all this. And if my computer didn't get stuck, okay, here. So um, then basically just to summarize this quickly, we didn't see any uh, developmental abnormality or, the, or, or morphological phenotype. These are the brains, they basically look the same. We did single cell sequencing and we also didn't see any difference in cell type composition. We see all the types of cells and, and similar proportions in the, in the knockout. And also we don't see this thing that we saw in the mouse that had uh, issues with the uh, connectivity. So it seems morphologically, they're pretty much uh, normal, which is different from the mouse phenotype that as, as I show has different developmental and morphological defects. Uh, but what we saw defects was actually neuronal functionality and, and, and synaptic activity, et cetera. And here what we see, again, I won't get into details, but we see an increase in the amplitude of the waves and not, not so much in the frequency. And we see also like a random activation of only one side of the body instead of two, which really fits with these uh, curved uh, phenotypes. And this, again, yes, this is similar to what also we see in mouse, where we see this uh, type of uh, neuronal function at activation. So the conclusion from this is basically that in the case of, of of the flies, we don't see much of a, a problem in, in development, but we see that uh, neurons don't, don't work uh, normally. Now back to some uh, more computational analysis. We really wanted to see what was behind that in terms of the, the targets. And of course we did our of the of the brains. And you can see again here, a very clear misregulation pretty much only of microaxons uh, when we knock out this, uh, this factor and it's very specific and mainly a neural microaxons. And again, we also see that these are quite, uh, well, again, specific, perhaps a bit uh, broader than the case of, of mammals in terms of length, but also quite, quite unique. Then uh, we characterize the targets a little bit more in detail. Uh, the first thing we see is again, they're quite neuron specific. This is the inclusion of the emic targets of the microaxons in flies. You can see uh, quite specific to neurons and not so much included in, in glia. And when we look at the different uh, tissues and cell types that are available for flies, which is something quite good, because there's a lot of stuff out there. We see again that they're very neuron specific. We also discover a few that are quite uh, specific of, of the photoreceptors in the eye, which we uh, want to investigate a bit more. And overall, what we see is that despite they look like a weird thing, these microaxons, actually they are one third of all neural axons in, in Drosophila. So we're talking about a very important uh, part of the program of uh, splicing in, 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 the, in the brain of Drosophila. And uh, then uh, the last thing that I will tell you is actually what refers to the title, which is how these microaxons that are regulated in Drosophila really relate to the ones that, are, that we know are regulated in, 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 the brain, in vertebrates. Because we saw certain phenotypes that are, of course, they're all neuronal phenotypes, but they may, I mean, they're not exactly the same ones as we see in, in vertebrates. Uh, and therefore the targets could be the same or could be different or could be a mixture of the two. 
So we wanted to compare the two, but we have here a, a technical problem, and is that really there's no tools to analyze conservation of exons, especially at that uh, big uh, evolutionary distances. And therefore, that's where we, for this and other reasons, we developed uh, a tool uh, we call the exorcist, which is really a tool that works similarly, or the, the output is similar to the many tools that are for gene orthology assessment, but here is at the exon level. And the trick uh, that basically we use here is to generate this, what we call intron position aware or IPA uh, protein alignments, where you align protein by protein and, and as many pairwise uh, comparisons as you want. And we put basically the position of the intron. So this is the, an intron in phase zero and another intron in phase zero. So this would be an exon, an exon, and an exon. And what we require here for true homology is, first of all, that uh, the intron positions are conserved because really this is the essence of uh, uh, exon homology. So the introns cannot define the, the right exons. And then, of course, we require sequence conservation and that conservation, and also for the upstream and downstream uh, introns and exons. And what is interesting about this uh, software is that really can work on any evolutionary distance because all these parameters can be can be changed. So we can compare human and mouse, but also human and, and Drosophila as well, or, or, or plants. Uh, this, of course, is a bit more complex and has different uh, functionalities, etc. So if you're interested, you can you can check it. It's also almost uh, it's in archive. It's almost accepted. And Basically, then going back to the to the story, we use these to really see the conservation of these microexons. And what we saw is that the as we knew, the, the conservation is very high across vertebrates. But as soon as you come out of vertebrates, there's a huge drop, and basically almost none of the microexons are found in the genomes of the other species. So when we do the same for flies, we see a very high conservation with drosophilids, but here quickly they just jump and this very my conservation in other insects, and then, of course, nothing in, in compared to vertebrates. So what we see here is basically a parallel assembly of the two uh, programs. So we basically have a complete different set of microexons in one species and in another. And then when we look at the kind of genes that uh, evolve these, these microexons in each of the lineages, what we see is that they are actually differentially enriched for uh, different uh, functions that uh, somehow make sense for for biology and this actually uh, for neuron biology and these are quite a strong uh, distinct uh, function. So simplifying a little bit, but I think it's uh, quite illustrative. What we see is that in, in, in mammals and invertebrates, we see a very strong enrichment from functions related to uh, vesicle transport and vesicle regulation. So the synapse basically would be like the biology of the, the, the vesicles and the neurotransmitter release. And the ones that are shared, and actually the four microexons that we have conserved are all cytoskeletal proteins, they impact the cytoskeleton. So perhaps this is the ancestral functionality of microexons, or it was the first uh, kind of microexons regulated in the ancestor. And in the case of flies, we saw a very massive, strong enrichment for channels. Uh, but, uh, this was quite strong, and we uh, basically what they impact is every kind of channel that we have in the, in the neurons of, of the fly. So you can see that by impacting different parts of the synapses, we end up with neural phenotypes, but basically this is done in an independent uh, manner, or they diverge to impact it in different ways. And then just to exemplify this uh, channel enrichment and, and the different mechanisms uh, related to the specialization, as I started at the beginning, here we have a voltage gated uh, calcium channel with all the different subunits. And basically the idea is that in case of vertebrates, we have this whole genome duplication. So we have lots of copies of the, of the subunits which can diverge and you know, specialize and diversify. And in the case of flies, they mainly keep one single gene. And, but these ones are fully, or they are all impacted by at least one microexon. So you can see how using either alternative splicing or gene uh, re, uh, duplication, they can really uh, specialize and diversify the functions of the channel. And with that, I conclude, I think, well, may, well maybe a little bit over time, but the, um, the idea is, as I said, the microexons have contributed to neuronal protein specialization, at least since the last common ancestor of bilaterians, and that despite this very conserved regulatory mechanism that is still regulating uh, neuronal transcriptomes for 600 million years, the actual targets behind these were actually rewired in the two uh, different lineages. 
And with that, I just the acknowledges, uh, acknowledgements. Uh, again, Antonio, that was an amazing PhD student, uh, really amazing. And then everybody else uh, contributed to this project. Much of what I show you was, was done in collaboration with Ben Blenko and also with uh, Juan Balcarce's lab, especially Sophie. And then uh, a lot of the work from what flies was essential uh, help was uh, Lucia Prieto and, and, and then all the collaborators that also helped with different, different aspects. And then for the exorcist and the exon conservation, you can, if you're interested, please feel free to ask. Uh, it was basically Jamile Marquez and Federica Mantica. And with that, thank you very much. I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks, Manu. I think uh, the easiest would be for people to, I don't know, to jump and ask questions. Mm -hmm. Sure. I see David. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Very, very, very nice. But, but hundreds of questions come <laughs> from this. One, 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 one simple one, and then we, I think we have time later for, for some discussion. But. Mm -hmm. um, so could this be a way of in including more variability and that different lineages have picked up in a different way? Because uh, if, if you think, so the, the, the way to introduce one function, first, one of the questions that I have is, do these uh, genes with microaxons are tend to be more duplicated in the genome? Because I would expect that something like this and more in development, developmental genes, which you have to be careful and you cannot play around with them. So probably the Hox genes and all those those have, have, have duplicated. I don't know whether these are. And then this could be a source of, of variability in general, like mutations or whatever. And there could be signals for splicing randomly within introns. Have you uh, some hypothesis or some idea with this? Uh, yeah, well, so, so many concepts there yeah, and ideas. Yeah, so yeah the, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so regarding the duplication, the, gen the rule, the general rule is that uh, genes with alternative splicing tend to have less, uh, like fewer copies and vice versa. Now, this doesn't mean like in many cases, these this channels, for instance, they, they do have alternative splicing also in, in vertebrates, although they have many copies. So of course there are some gene families that tend to diversify molecularly, both in terms of paralogy and, and alternative splicing. Uh, so transcription factors, for instance, they tend to retain a lot of copies from the whole genome duplication of vertebrates, but they don't, they don't usually have a lot of alternative splicing. In a way, this is also how you, the, the, you know, define alternative splicing, and it's a whole, of course, uh, complicated issue here. Uh, but when we talk about regulated, um, like this very tissue-specific alternative splicing, which is a massive minority, uh, you know, I think you, 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 there's not such a clear rule of uh, fewer duplicates or more alternative splicing. Now, the, regarding the, the second point, um, we don't really know how microexons originate. One thing we see, which I think is quite nice, is that they tend, to, so they're not the same, so they, they, they keep evolving in different lineages, but often they target similar uh, genes, for example. So even you see a microexon in certain part of the gene, and then in another species, you see it in a different part of the gene. And I think this is simply, it could be like convergence. In a way, you can think of it as like having different uh, transcriptional enhancers that you can lose one, but then have another one. And overall, they may impact, the, for example, protein-protein interactions in a similar way. So there's a little, a little bit of redundancy. Uh, there might be a little bit of functional redundancy in that sense. But this is something that we want to test because, of course, it could be many of things. Uh, and again, I want to stress here that when talking about the highly regulated uh, exons and how they happen in the genome, yeah, I guess it's probably uh, the way it has to be is that you have some, by chance, some this UGC motif, and then you kind of recruit the splice to some in some cryptic exon. But the truth is that we haven't seen any uh, novel microexon coming into play, you know, like we don't. I we see, don't have any evidence of a very uh, recent microexon that is yes. not that clear. See, we see, have see. a lot of cryptic exons of all kinds, but this is like so much noise mm. there. That, uh, one thing we, we saw recently, which we didn't expect, and I don't think it's an evolutionary mechanism, but still, when we take a long exon and we make it shorter, in some cases, when they have this UDC motif, they actually react to this SSRM4. So they stop being included and they need SSRM4 for inclusion, which I think is quite nice. Mm -hmm. 
I don't see this happening very often, but it's another possibility. And, and I know I could be talking many other interesting areas yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Very nice, very nice talk. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you. Uh, Raquel, maybe? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Well, great talk. Uh, I was surprised to to find that the you know the the mechanism that regulates the inclusion of these microactions seems to be so straightforward. It's basically the expression of this splicing factor. If it's expressed, the microaction is spliced in. Uh, so what I, I think that completely is that uh, this uh, splicing factor is our M4 is expressing brain, but is is it expressing in different tissues like the isoform that does not or oh, the isoform that uh, includes the exon and then you don't have the PFAM domain. So, it, sorry, my, so my question is, so this, uh, this, the functional SRM4 mm -hmm. uh, isoform that includes the PFAM domain is only expressed in brain and in the other tissues, uh, express the other isoform without the PFAM domain. And if so, uh, do you know what regulates the inclusion of this exon specifically in brain? Yes, uh, so the, this depends on the species that you're talking about. But if we separate the vertebrates and the, and the non-vertebrates, uh, like the flies that, uh, so these are the ones that have the two isoforms, the one with the domain and the one without domain, which I think is what you were asking. So the gene is highly expressed everywhere because most, uh, so the cells need the canonical isoform for regular splicing. So when we knock out the entire gene, it's lethal. I mean, there's like, there's no development there. So, uh, what happens is exactly you have it uh, expressed in in every cell and only in the brain you have the isoform in addition the isoform with the micro it's not a hundred percent you have like both isoforms and in terms of the regulation uh, I think here so what we see is very clearly uh, there's this LF LAV protein which is a classic neuronal marker that regulates this alternative uh, last uh, exon processing so uh, you can see really when when you when you express the um, the protein even in non neural cells it's sufficient to switch from one to the other so again what we have here is that this neural marker regulates the processing of the amic so now you have the amic in the neural cells in neural cells and therefore you have micro so it's also quite simple yeah, so it seems that the splicing is only regulated by binding protein. So I was just wondering if there was any epigenetic regulation behind, because I think, for instance, that methylation levels in mm -hmm. exons can affect the, the splicing too. Uh, yeah. But it seems it's not the case here. No, I mean, I think for microexons and, and tissue specific uh, exons, epigenetic regulation is not a big deal, I would say. It, and, and generally, I think it's more of fine, fine tuning. I think it, we're still lacking evidence that this is a major mechanism overall. There might be one or two cases, but I think it's being hard to, to find the connection. And uh, one question I think you might have addressed this uh, when you were finishing the previous question, but I was wondering if you could, uh, because this uh, splicing factor recognizes the motive, if you artifactually you know, integrate these binding factors in longer exons and you express SRM4, is then long, can, it, can, it, can it regulate the inclusion of longer exons? Yeah, so in some cases we have evidence that it regulates longer exons as well. Uh, it's the minority. Um, the problem with longer exons, let's say the problem, is that they they are normally very included. So the ones, so the, the, the let's say the, the splicing architecture of the micro exons. When you let's let's think of the other way. So when when I take a micro exon and I increase the size. Of the exon, I end up with 100% inclusion with or without the regulator because it's well defined. It's just that because it's short, it doesn't get included, but everything else is strong as, a, as an exon. So, you know, if you take a weak exon, let's say a cryptic exon, and you put this the, the, the motif, uh, we are not seeing this happening because probably they need a very strong five prime supply side and things like that. Thank you. Aida. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for the talk. So I have a quick question, I think, but on the context of the, um, where you were talking about the micro exon switching during neuronal differentiation. Yeah, I was wondering if, if 
I mean, if you have a study at some point, uh, like I, I was thinking about uh, in when you have some cancer status, you could have this kind of undifferentiation scenario, right? So mm -hmm. maybe um, this, you, you could have there some upregulation of, well, I think downregulation of these splicing factors mm -hmm. and then the microexome. So um, it's, yeah. it's something that you could, I mean, study like in parallel, like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is, this is a very, or? it's a very good question. The, the thing is that it's already being answered, let's say. So the, yeah. the lab, <laughs> so the lab of Luis Serrano in, at CRG, I mean, we, we collaborate a little bit with them, but uh, Sara, a postdoc there that basically she had that kind of idea. And what she sees is, well, in general, when, if you have the differentiation from like glioblastoma, et cetera, that you do, you do see these uh, changes. But what is interesting is that even in, in cancers that have uh, nothing to do with neural origin, therefore you really have low level, no microexons or very low levels of most microexons. And this SRM4 is basically at the noise level, let's put it this way. You have even a strong silencing of the gene. And this is the, the gene that gets, and so the splicing factor that gets most consistently downregulated in all cancers. Don't ask me why. And uh, even like, and this you can see at the RNA level, so going from all, not, almost nothing to really nothing. And then you see like very strong uh, also methylation. So for whatever reason, just a little bit of this uh, splicing factor and a little bit of the microexons, it's counterproductive for uh, cancer growth. So indeed, when you reduce this, you see the cancer, I mean, they, they so when you incre increase it a little bit, you see that actually they grow uh, less than any cell types, any cell line. Okay. And do you have any information about the other cancer types or something? <laughs> I mean, any hypothesis? On this? What do you mean other cancer types? Uh, I mean, that, that you said that this, this, you observe this finding across different cancer types, yeah. right? not only okay. neuronal related ones. Yeah. I guess the normal cells can tolerate certain levels of, of these microexons with overall would somehow, no idea why, lead to a uh, slightly, you know, a slowly uh, replication. So I guess cancers are just very optimal in the sense that they're highly selected. So they would even, yeah, they would all use all possible tricks to enhance, uh, to speed up uh, proliferation. So I think this is a, is a, is a break for proliferation even if this is small, and they seem to be able to uh, turn it even down, like further down. So this is, I mean, you can see the, pa the papers in Plus Biology was published this year, if you're curious. Okay. And they have different assays of competition assays too, because really it's like a relatively subtle competition. Well, not, not subtle, but you need to, to do it and think about it in terms of competition, cell competition. And I have to say just one quick thing. Uh, so there's a, prost a prostate cancer, there's a specific type that actually upregulates uh, SSRM4 and microexons. And this seems to be important for the, for the cancer, which is a weird thing, but weird things happen in cancer. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Well, I, if there, is, there are no other questions, I'll ask a quick one mm -hmm. and then we can leave it here. So uh, I, I was wondering if you could, do you have any hypothesis of how this domain was gained in the ancestor of the jellyfish? Like, how do you gain such a piece of sequence that is so important, especially in an isoform in the in the neuronal tissue? I don't know. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a, it's a one million dollar question. So it wasn't in, well in the ancestor of bilaterians, but the we like I said we don't we don't have any. It doesn't look like anything uh, that we know. So it's really difficult to hypothesize. I mean, it's a short one. So the assumption is that it was just by chance. But I, uh, I mean, this is as far as we can get. We cannot see any exon shuffling evidence. It might look like a bit of a RRM, a RRM degenerated and all at, at some point we thought, but it doesn't even seem to have an obvious structure. It's just a couple of amino acids. So. Yeah. Okay, so something happened and, and yeah. Something okay. happened and yeah, <laughs> somehow it also, because you need a lot of events there, right? You need these to become a neural specific in theory. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a bit tricky. Okay, I see. Yeah, and it's tricky to study then because yeah, there is and, no... And, and what, yeah, and what we see, I mean, you have to have this, so an intron interrupting this. So you need to have the sequence, you need to have an intron interrupting the sequence and something to actually make sure that you don't have the sequence all the time. So something that actually breaks. So there's a lot of events there that ordering them is not trivial. Okay. 
I see. Okay. Cool, Manu, thank you so much. I think it was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. So thanks a lot for being here. And then we will continue the discussion offline with me and with other PI. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Virtual applause and, yeah. and thanks for coming. Thank you. <laughs> thank Hope you. Hope to see you soon. Yeah. See you soon. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.